the last lecture, I described the dysfunctions that occur when we tell time either exclusively by Cairo cycles or exclusively by chronological historical timeline. But the good news of Jesus points Christians toward a third way of understanding the horizon of meaning by which we might judge the significance of contemporary events. When the fullness of time had come, the word who created Kronos stepped into chronological history. Hence the mundane events of Kronos now participate in the holy significance of Kairos. The Old Testament prophets provide glimpses of this perspective and in the centuries following the incarnation, Christians developed further ways of understanding and inhabiting this tension between divine Kairos time and mundane Kronos time. Writers such as Augustine and Dante urged believers to judge the meaning of their lives and of contemporary events by a mode of figural interpretation that locates the events of Kronos within a divine drama enacted in Kairos time. While this drama plays out in Kairos, it continues to punctuate Kronos. On this view, God's story provides the grammar by which history and its affairs, the news, becomes meaningful. When Rome was sacked in 410, Christians were shocked. How could God allow Rome, a Christian empire, to fall at the hands of pagan barbarians? It was in response to this pressing question that Augustine wrote The City of God. The conversion of Constantine had led many Christians to conflate Christianity with the Roman Empire itself and redemptive time with historical time. As the church came to feel at home in the world, so she became reconciled to time, as the theologian Bruce Chilton explains. He goes on to argue that such an identification of Kairos and Kronos led to a false and dangerous comfort. Time on such an understanding seems to be totally baptized by eternity, as if one were living in the moment of ultimate judgment and vindication. Many Christians conceived of matters in that way, and for that reason, the inevitable setbacks of the empire, most notably Alaric's sack of Rome in 410, were more than embarrassments. They shook to its foundations the faith that the empire and human time itself had entered into eternity. Augustine's response to this error was to reassert a distinction between God's city and all earthly political cities. Because God's city was the dominion of love, timeless and enduring, human cities could only approximate it, soldiering on until such a moment as heaven's eternity truly did become all in all. With Augustine, a normative Christian history was born as well as a skepticism that ordinary human time could be definitive. On a Christian Augustinian account then, the events of Kronos are indeed meaningful, but their meaning cannot be read sequentially. Rather, history's true meaning emerges only in the light of Christ's life. This is the result of understanding Kairos and Kronos as stitched together through the events of the Incarnation. Christians cannot replace morning, morning prayer with the newspaper, as Hegel claims, but neither can we just discard the paper. Instead, we have to inhabit the often painful and confusion, confusing tension between Kairos and Kronos, prayer and the news, divine redemption and the events of history. As Karl Barth recommends, Christians should read the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, but we should take care to interpret newspapers from our Bibles. And it's this fraught stance that's required of Christians because, as Augustine reminds us, the earthly and the heavenly cities are inextricably intermingled one with the other. Such a reality makes discerning the significance of the news difficult. Kronos is caught up with the creator's kairos, but these times haven't yet been fully aligned. Simply stating this theological claim, of course, does not clear up all confusion regarding how we should read and interpret the news. That work requires discernment. And in this endeavor, we can learn from the good and bad examples of those who have faithfully tried to discern God's redemptive action in the news of their time. The Old Testament prophets act as early guides in this task because they responded to the political and social events of their day by drawing on divine revelation. Our modern notion of a prophet as someone who foretells the future can color our expectations when we read the Jewish prophets of the Old Testament. For the most part, the prophets do not prognosticate particular future events. Rather, they declare how the news of their day fits within the grand movements of God's Kairos drama. As David Lyle Jeffrey observes, biblical prophets make no claim to novelty. A prophet isn't some kind of political or economic advisor who 
consults the right polls and collects the right samples so as to be able to call an election, predict a coup, anticipate a fall from political favor, or a rise in the stock market. Rather, as the Hebrew title Nabi indicates, a prophet is one who speaks or proclaims the word of God. And as one who proclaims in time the word from out of time, the prophet inhabits this painful tension between Kronos and Kairos. As Jeffrey writes, the prophet, like other men, belongs to his time, and yet he stands for a terrible moment also outside of temporal order. One foot in Kronos, the other in Kairos, his ear to eternity and his mouth toward the city, he speaks as he is directed. So the difficult task of the prophet is to call God's people to respond to the news of their day by the light of God's eternal word. Dante is Auerbach's chief exemplar of figural realism, uh, a way of reading time that uh, is descended from the biblical prophets. Dante's divine comedy situates a panoply of historical figures within a vibrantly imagined cosmic order. Dante remains deeply concerned with the affairs of Kronos, but he insists on finding their meaning within an eternal drama. As Auerbach puts it in describing Dante's sense of time, the beyond is eternal, and yet phenomenal. It is changeless and of all time, and yet full of history. Perhaps the best way to grasp Dante's figural realism and its implications for how we should and should not value the news is through a contrast between two Florentine aristocrats and the character of Dante himself. Dante encounters Farinata and Calvacante in Canto 10 of the Inferno. Virgil has led Dante to the sixth circle where the heretics are suffering in flaming tombs. As they walk along, Farinata hears Dante's accent and rises out of his tomb to ask him about the news from Florence. After all, it's not every day that a living person from your hometown walks past your place of torment. Dante is understandably startled by this abrupt interruption. And when he tells Farinata who his ancestors are, they realize they are on opposite sides of a bitter division within Florentine politics. You think uh, Republicans and Democrats hate each other, Wait till you see Florence. Farinata boasts to Dante that his Ghibellines drove Dante's gulfs out of Florence twice. But Dante retorts that both times the gulfs regained power and that now the Ghibellines are in exile. Before Farinata can respond to this bad news, Calvacante pops up from the same tomb to interrupt their conversation and ask Dante for news of his own son, the poet Guido. Dante refers to his friend Guido in the past tense and Calvacante thinking this mean his, means his son has died, cries out in despair and falls back into the tomb. Without even acknowledging this interruption, in fact, one would never guess from their utter lack of interrupt, interruption that uh, Farinata and Cavalcante are actually in-laws, Farinata resumes his dialogue with Dante and makes a remarkable admission. The news that his political faction has lost power and been exiled from Florence is more torment to me than this bed. He warns Dante, however, that in just four years, Dante and his political faction, because by this time Dante's gulfs have themselves split into competing groups, will be defeated and exiled from Florence. Dante's perplexed. How can Farinata be ignorant of current events in Florence if he knows what will happen in the near future? Farinata explains that the souls in the inferno are far-sighted. They see events in the past and the future, but they can't see what is happening right now in the present. The result of this condition is that when Christ returns and Kronos time ends, only the eternal present will remain, and the suffering souls in hell will lose all awareness. And the irony of their punishment lies in the fact that Farinata and Calvacante are cut off from the only thing they care about, the life of the body and the present. As Epicureans, they're supposedly in the circle of the heretics for believing that the soul dies with the body. But one of the manifestations of their heresy is an obsession with temporal concerns. Even in the midst of eternal suffering, Kronos events provide the only horizon by which they can find meaning and significance. They couldn't care less about their place and God's eternal order. Instead, they're both desperate for news from home. And from our perspective, 700 years later, the news they care about seems pretty petty. One wants to know whether his son is winning poetry slam competitions, and the other wants the latest political gossip. This obsession with Kronos defines their fate as heretics. Even in hell, they don't really believe in the reality of God's drama. 
These men represent warnings for Dante because he is tempted in similar ways. Like Theranata, Dante had poured himself into Florentine politics, and he only wrote the Divine Comedy because his party was overthrown and he was exiled. Forced to give up his political ambitions, Dante reassessed the eternal value of his endeavors and devoted himself to religious poetry. Yet even this pursuit comes with temptations. Like Guido's father, Dante is tempted to invest too much significance in intellectual and artistic achievements and find his worth in the praise and awards due his poetic accomplishments. I don't have time to unpack Dante's full development over the course of his journey, but one scene from near the end of the comedy gives a sense of the alternative Kairos perspective that he ultimately gains. Dante's progress through Paradiso frees him from an overinvestment in temporal concerns. So from the heights of the seventh sphere, Beatrice instructs Dante to look down and see how far he's come. Dante can now smile at the way his heavenly viewpoint puts the affairs of the scrawny globe in perspective. He writes, The little threshing floor that so incites our savagery was all from hills to river mouths revealed to me while I wheeled with eternal Gemini. Dante's vision here may seem to belittle earthly news and the events of Kronos, but as his comedy demonstrates, he does care deeply about the people and affairs of his historical time. He has learned, though, to care about them from a divine vertical perspective rather than from the historical horizontal perspective within which Farinate and Cavalcante remain trapped. Dante's goal, then, is to articulate the multiplicity of vertical links that relate every earthly phenomenon to the plan of salvation conceived by providence. This doesn't mean that the events of our mundane time are unimportant, but they are all relative to the divine drama of heaven. And it's this eschatological horizon that provides their ultimate source of meaning. However, as we don't yet inhabit the earthly perspective from which Dante views the little threshing floor of our world, it remains a fraught and difficult task to properly assign significance to the headlines that populate our news feeds. At one point in Jesus' ministry, he himself warned against being too quick to, to assign significance to the events of the day. Some people had told him about the shocking report that Pilate slaughtered a group of Galileans while they were sacrificing the temple. But Jesus responds to this news with a surprising injunction. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He goes on to bring up another recent event, a tower that fell over in Siloam, killing 18 people, and he draws the same lesson from this tragedy, so Jesus responds to these two horrifying headlines, neither by moralizing nor by expressing outrage. Instead, he enjoins his listeners to examine their own hearts. If Jesus himself is reticent to assign the events of Kronos to a particular place in God's providential drama, then we should be particularly hesitant to do so. There is a cosmic struggle being waged on this earthly stage, but our human perspective doesn't allow us to discern its final meaning. Christ's repeated injunction to repent parallels the prophets who pointed to the events of their time as framing the day of decision. And his example indicates that a fig figural imagination should lead us to respond to the events of Kronos by asking how these events might invite us to practice repentance or forgiveness or shalom now in our particular contexts. Such questions are key to an eschatological horizon of meaning. Because Christian hope is not rooted in historical time, but rather in the eschaton, the drama of the daily news is relativized and muted. Even the biblical prophets, for all their dire warnings, have a high view of divine providence and so an essentially comic view of the world. As Dante defines the genre, comedy begins with some adverse circumstances, but its theme has a happy termination. The prophets often begin by warning that the day of the Lord will be a day of judgment, but they also insist it will be a day of mercy and reconciliation. This comic view should inoculate us against the fear and frenzy peddled by the politicians and advertisers and journalists who are enmeshed in Kronos. Fear motivates us to buy or vote or click, but faith in the comic outcome of God's drama frees us to love faithfully. As Auerbach argues, Christian figural realism blunts the tragic climaxes of Kronos, and it does so by transposing the center of gravity from life on earth 
into a life beyond, thereby relativizing daily striving, success, and failure. So eschatological hope, rooted in the comic outcome of God's Kairos drama, frees us to live faithfully and joyfully now without the burden of worrying whether our side will win. We already know that Christ wins, even as we know that his victory is cruciform and will involve us in the suffering and pain of Kronos. Anchored in this eschatological hope, Christians can develop figural imaginations that attend to the events of the news while seeking their meaning in the pattern of God's Kairos drama. I'll conclude this lecture by suggesting two practices that might help us cultivate such a figural imagination. The first is simply to practice Kairos time. The chief means by which the church has fostered this mode of keeping time, beyond, of course, the weekly reenactment of Sabbath and the Eucharist, is through the liturgical year. Habituating ourselves to these liturgical seasons frees us from the tyranny of Kronos and trains us to tell time according to God's kingdom rather than the 24-7 news media. Excellent books like Seeking God's Face, Praying with the Bible Through the Year, or the, the Anglican Prayer Book, the Book of Common Prayer, make it easy to follow the basic contours of the liturgical year and invite us to begin each day with the perennial news of the Word. Families and friends can also draw on books like Every Moment Holy, which has a collection of sample liturgies to mark an incredibly wide range of events, from To Mark the First Hearth Fire of the Season to For the Sound of Sirens. These liturgies invite readers to habituate themselves to a rhythm of prayer. My second suggestion is to meditate on art heed to Kairos. It can be difficult to discern figural patterns in today's breaking news, so one effective way of cultivating a figural imagination is to see how Christian artists have endeavored to fit the events of their times into God's Kairos drama. This endeavor contrasts starkly with most contemporary art, which aspires to make some statement about our political or social context, perhaps involving climate change, immigration, or gender. Each week, it seems, there is some new cause celebre, and artists latch onto these causes in an event to be in history's avant-garde. Many of these are worthy causes, but they can't be understood or resolved within the sequential frame of chronos, and most artistic responses to hashtag fads devolve into banal propagand propagandistic gestures. However, there's a rich tradition of Christian art that offers an alternative to an imagination caught within a historical horizon of meaning. Dante's Divine Comedy is obviously a paradigmatic example, but he's far from alone. I could enumerate many literary works or paintings that demonstrate a Christian figural imagination, but I'll briefly touch on just two that might teach us how to, in Wendell Berry's words, walk the tottering edge between eternity and time. Peter Bruegel, The Elder's Paintings, such as The Census of Bethlehem, the massacre of the innocents and the conversion of Paul place these biblical narratives in contemporary contexts and suggest how the gospel might inform viewers' perspective on contemporary events, whether religious wars or bureaucratic regimes. These judgments were in fact recognized by his contemporary viewers. The emperor whose troops Bruegel depicted slaughtering babies had these painted over with food and bundles when he acquired the painting, changing the massacre to a mere plunder. A more contemporary example of this imaginative mode can be found in the St. John's Bible, a handwritten and masterfully illuminated Bible commissioned by the monks at St. John's Abbey in Minnesota to mark the new millennium. Many of the images demonstrate uh, this kind of figural imagination, but one of the most striking is the Luke Anthology, which features parables and stories that are unique to Luke. The artist Donald Jackson was working on this illumination on September 11th, 2001. And he decided to add the Twin Towers alongside the father who was welcoming home the prodigal son. This composition invites us to ask how we might practice the love and forgiveness demonstrated by the father in response to these horrific attacks. These sorts of Christian artworks can inspire us to exercise a figural imagination ourselves as we interpret the meaning of the events around us in light of God's revelation. The 12th century educator Hugh of St. Victor held the Christian conviction that all things and events of this world acquire their meaning from the place at which they are inserted in the history of creation and salvation. As a result, Hugh sought to embed the Christian drama into the memory of each student so they could locate any event or fact within sacred history. Art that portrays the intersection of God's Kairos drama with the mundane events of Kronos can build up this mode of Christian memory and train us to fit the events of our lives and society 
into God's ongoing redemptive work. If you read the day's news and then look up and see a print of the Luke anthology, you might be reminded that you are a creature of two times and that God's time provides the ultimate horizon of meaning for your life and its decisions. Such art reminds us that the organizing principle of our lives should not be the stream of chronos represented in our news feeds, but the drama in which God is redeeming his fallen creation. And such art might teach us to tell time Christianly so that we can discern the eternal significance of the news of our day. Thank you.